uh, methodology that we have followed. Certainly, I've followed this for the last 37 years that I've been doing knees. So we start with the capsular ligament, the menisco femoral, menisco tibial. In severe deformities, you need to uh, release the semimembranosus. The superficial medial collateral has both an anterior and a posterior component. I would urge you to try as far as possible not to touch this. Uh, a lot of surgeons would take down the PCL, no real arguments with them. We like to retain it in most of our cases. And very, very infrequently, you might need to uh, release the presence rhinus as well. So our technique is, as part of our exposure, we do our ligament release, which means that by the time we have finished exposing the knee, we have done our medial posterior medial soft tissue releases, and we check without any bony resections uh, that our deformity is corrected. The caveat to that is that we would take down the ostifies on the medial femoral condyle, the medial tibial plateau, and we should be able to get 85-90% of our deformities corrected there, if you can. Then go to the bony cuts, and then you do the final titration in terms of ligament balance, and that's your final uh, last bit where you get your preferred alignment options. <coughs> One of the critical things about knees, and particularly uh, relevant in severe deformity, is to get your rotation right. Uh, if you look at all the, uh, the various technologies and techniques, the one thing that comes out at the end of when you look at the conclusion is everything works well. Every alignment system works well. You do a CRPS, they work well. Uh, you replace the pedal or don't replace the pedal, they just seem to do well. But the one critical ingredient in all of these is you have to get your rotation right. So your sagittal alignment and your rotational alignment is absolutely critical on the femoral side. You can use the AP axis, the transepicondylar axis, the posterior femoral condyle, or the transtibial axis. And I would urge you, for those of you starting off, use more than one landmark. So basically checking and cross-checking that you got your alignment absolutely right. Here is the critical prop, uh, issue. Yeah, we're talking about the various knees. Severe various knees will always have a compensatory or adaptive posterior condylar overgrowth. And this is the reason why we have always made a big deal, a big point about using anterior referencing system, as you can see over here, the reason for it is if you use posterior referencing system where your paddles are going to the posterior contacts, because of the overgrowth, which is an adaptive overgrowth to compensate for the deformity or the defect on the tibia, your femoral component goes into internal rotation, which is the one thing you do not want it to do. So always, the more severe the deformities, we would make a big case for doing an anterior referencing system. On the tibial side, it is a little more uh, relatively straightforward, but again, huge areas of conflict uh, in terms of rotation. The, we use the extramedullary guide as I think most surgeons do. The standard thing was the medial third, third of the tibial tubercle, but I'll tell you that that is very variable. We have published quite extensively on this, uh, and our recommendation is to do what we call a curve on curve alignment, which means your trial, the anterolateral surface of the trial, aligning to the anterolateral surface of your cut resected tibia. If you match those two together, you will always be anatomical in relation to the anatomy of that particular individual. So if you do that, you don't have to worry about tibial tubercles and so on, and you'll find that you'll be in the right ballpark. Uh, the other point that I'd like to make here is that when you're using the low part of a tibial resection guide, keep it just medial to the tibialis anterior tendon. It's not the center of the, uh, the gap between the second and third metatarsal. That will take your tibial cut into various. Just pull the low part of the boom of the rod towards the tibialis anterior, just put one finger on the tibialis anterior. So you need to have your rod immediately abutting 
the um, TBL is anterior tendon. The other point that you need to do, the more severe your deformity, and we're talking now specific to various knees, resect less tibia, five, six millimeters, seven would be the outside. And when you do that, you'll get this, uh, this type of a resected uh, wafer. So you'll get an incongruous cut. Uh, we rarely if ever to go beyond six, six and a half, seven millimeters. The second thing, if you are a CR retainer like I am, make uh, make it a point to remove as much of the interchondral ostephytes and the posterior condylar, of, uh, posterior condylar uh, ostephytes. Uh, and this way, you will avoid damaging the PCL. Uh, as I said, in the surgical technique, you need to remove the ostephytes. Now, standardly, we do this as a part of our exposure, but I recognize the fact that a lot of surgeons will do it at the end. A particular ostephyte, which you can see over here, uh, on the on the medial side is where, is where the uh, where the medial collateral is attached, and that point there is usually a spike of bone that tends the medial collateral ligament. Usually goes a long way down the back of the medial femoral condyle. Identify it, remove it, and you suddenly realize that your deformity gets corrected. Um, now, in terms of uh, the posterior, uh, most most uh, various deformities will be accompanied by flexion contractures. You recreate the posterior recess and both your gutters, the medial and the lateral gutters are critical. The posterior recess is very, very important. Again, um, if you take down the PCL and severe deformities, not the end of the world, 80% probably do it. But all I'm trying to say is you can retain the PCL, balance it and get an excellent outcome as well. So this is our sequence. If you have associated flexion contractors, you release the capsule posteriorly, remove the posterior osteoporosis, recreate your posterior recess. We would recommend not to resect more than two millimeters beyond the distal femur for the reason that when you go beyond two millimeters, A, you cannot retain the PCL, you sacrifice it. So if you're a PCL sacrificer, that's all right. But remember, the more proximal you go on the distal tibia, you're opening yourself up to one of the very dangerous entities that is called flexion instability. You can recess the PCL either uh, on the femoral side or the tibial side. And to that extent, it's not the topic of this uh, presentation, but just to tell you today, we don't really bother too much about the PCL because we've gone now to using a medial congruent design, which is a a constrained liner, it has an anterior lip. So whether you have the PCL or not, you don't need to take out the box like you do for a PCL and you, it works both with the PCL and without the PCL. So that is pretty much uh, uh, our, uh, our go-to method. And this is the posterior ostipide, which you must remove because if you don't remove this, you are increasing your posterior counter offset and your flexion will be restricted. So at the end of the surgery, I mean, often people say, what is acceptable? I mean, what? how do you say this is a well-balanced thing? And this is our criteria. This is something that I picked up from Dr. Insal and uh, uh, his group. Your knee should open about one to two millimeters on the medial side and two, two to three on the lateral side. And this is in about 10 to 15 degrees of flexion. And if you are a CR retainer, then you will see on the, certainly the trials that we use, that we have these lines. They're both on the femur and the tibia. So the middle line on the tibia should align with the middle line on the femur. What is unacceptable? If you are a CR user, again like me, you want to make sure that as you're taking these knees into deep flexion, the tibia does not lift off. That means there's a tight PCL, there's a tight flexion gap. You have two or three choices. You, you can either increase your posterior tibial slope, but you have to do that up to a point. You can recess your PCL, or if you're not comfortable with it, you can take down the PCL, take down the box, and use a PS type of a design. So this is the pretty much the basic standard techniques that I think you would have read, seen, and a lot of people talk about it. I'm going to take you away from this uh, comfort zone 
And I'm going to sort of give you a very philosophical, the next uh, few slides, something that we have believed in. We, we won't show whether we were doing the right thing. We believe it is. And we recognized that the Vedas knee, like the valgus knee, has an angulatory, a translatory, and a subluxational torsional component. And this has not been recognized. Certainly, we believe it's not been given the due recognition that it is uh, due. The reason we say that is, if you look at the current uh, algorithms, when there is a severe deformity, a lot of surgeons, a lot of articles talk about manipulating the MCL by doing techniques like the medial epicondyl rostiotomy or pie crusting of the MCL. That for us is completely known. We believe that the MCL is a sacred ligament in the knee. And looking at that, we propose, we describe a morphological classification and algorithm for the various knee. Oh, sorry. So, as I said, we've described the current available options. Often when you over-release it, you need to increase the constraint. We know that increasing constraint gives you a stable construct, but oftentimes this will lead to early loosening. And should you be touching the MCL at all? So we believe that both these issues can be revisited and even a severe deformity can be addressed using primary implants with conventional minimal constraint. Uh, you may be familiar with Pavizi and Thin Ponds uh, classification, I'm not going to dwell on this. Very happy to say that uh, very recently, in fact, just uh, five days back, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Weber Bagaria worked on the same with the same uh, two authors and have expanded on this classification and it's been published in the American Born Joint Journal. So would recommend that you, you go through it. So here is really our philosophy. The contracted structures of the deep MCL, the PES, the marginal osteophyte, posterior medial capsule, debatable PCL, posterior osteophyte, semi-membranous insertions, and question mark, superficial medial collateral. What we do not recognize, and we've been doing this for almost 20 years in adrenaline care, I think, is also in these severe deformities, the postural lateral corner. So they all need sequential release, checking adequacy of correction, and release the MCL superficial part as a last resort. And by the technique that we are describing, you never need to touch it. So our addressed question was, is pie crusting of the MCL or medial epicondyl osteotomy ever required? So depending on the severity of the deformity, different people use medial releases, reduction osteotomies, they realign the tibial and the femoral cuts, you slope the cuts in, in a particular way, they pie crust the MCL due to sliding osteotomy of the medial epicondyl, and a lot of authors have reported good outcomes. Um, when we do this, also uh, concurrently, all of these authors have described the use of uh, uh, rotating hinge to, uh, or LCCK to obtain stability and balance. Again, as I keep going back to this, I'm going to keep reiterating that for me, the crucial critical ligament is the MCL and all your structures need to be balanced around it. So our premise is, can we balance our knees? Can we provide stability without compromising the integrity of the MCL? Some articles which take the contrary view, by Christing, uh, Quark um, in 2016, there are several authors after that have described the increments are unpredictable. And when we look at pie crusting, is it safe? Menguini's uh, article uh, also reported that there was catastrophic failures. Uh, let's come to the medial epicondyl osteotomy. This is Leo Whiteside's group. And they said whenever they did it, they needed a higher constrained option. MCL release, of course, was less, but they had lowered the, the medial epicondyle. And they, in fact, question the need for in the medial epicondyl osteotomy in various arthritic knees. This is a patient who was operated using a pie crusting technique, had a collapse of the medial uh, complex, and ended up with gross instability that we revised to a rotating hinge. Here is our classification. Uh, grade one is zero to five is correctable. 
5 to 10 again is correctable. So it's pretty much 0 to 10 in the correctable range. Uh, you deal with it by an osteotomy or a unique compartment, whatever philosophies you follow. And then we come to the fixed deformity, and we classified this into four cohorts. F1 is an angular deformity without subluxation, two uh, angular with subluxation and torsion, three translational variety, and four severe various deformity with global instability. And this is our classification. So a line drawn from the lateralmost edge of the tibial uh, condyle on, in F1 does not translate the tibia. In F2, it does, and our interosseous space is, is uh, compromised. Uh, translational variety is where the tibia actually subluxates linearly onto the medial side. Your in, uh, interosseous space is actually widened. And then you have this gross uh, deformity with bone loss and instability. This is our, our article on this, which got published uh, just about uh, three weeks ago. Um, and uh, we're happy to share the, the contents and the uh, link to this. So this is a very severe deformity. As you can see, this is pretty much um, what we would call a F2 variety. Uh, this is post-operative correction. We have used primary implants, a CR implant with uh, restitution of uh, alignment and uh, maintaining the position of the joint and the patella. Another patient, a 14-year follow-up, gross deformity. Again, you can see the interosseous space is maintained over here. So this again comes into our, what we would call a F2, F2 variety. You can see the, the restitution of alignment, good pedal tracking, this is at 14 years. Now these are typically the kind of cases where there is a subluxation, there's a torsion, and you can, you can diagnose that because the interosseous space is, is compromised. These are patients that we call F3 variety, and here, you will find that after you do all your releases, it's oftentimes a challenge to restore alignment. And if you put your finger down the posterior lateral corner, just behind the popliteus tendon, you'll find a tight tether, tight corner. And this is the posterior lateral tether that we have described in this article. And we, we release that. So these are again some uh, severe deformities preoperative x-rays, this is almost a 16-year follow-up. So we've been doing this forever. It just occurred to us that we should maybe report on this and uh, we took um, uh, this, uh, this study and published it recently. So this is the intraoperative image of uh, the postrolateral release and this is the postrolateral corner. Some of you might ask, what is the difference between the valgus knee and, and this is the difference. In the valgus knee, we, we start from the anterior tibial band, proceed posteriorly up to the posterior columnar capsule. In the varus knee, we only release the posterior lateral capsule at the level of the popliteus tendon by pie crusting the, uh, the capsule. And we do a pie crusting of the popliteus tendon and we leave everything else intact. This reduces the subluxation torsion achieve a stable knee without increasing the level of constraint or compromising the MCL. Very interesting x-ray. Uh, one of my fellows was actually operating this and he finished the surgery and uh, um, I said, can I have a look at it? And it obviously didn't look right to me. And uh, I, I asked him, I said, can we take a CM image? Uh, and we got a portable x-ray and this is what it showed. And you can see clearly that this uh, translation is, is still not adequately corrected. Uh, the patient was still under anesthesia. In fact, you can see the staples, the wound had been closed. We opened the wound and all we did was pie crusted that tether and the same patient within a couple of seconds has restored her alignment and we've got an excellent correction. And this is another, this is the intraoperative uh, of that same patient and you can see that there is a tibial lift off, subluxation. And after the release, you can see that it just drops into place and we get an excellent correction. We come to the F4, which is gross uh, deformities. This one, as you might imagine, is rheumatoid. You've all seen your share of these grotesque deformities. There's really no argument here. These will go for uh, RHK type of situation. So this is our algorithm. If, if it's correctable, well, you treat it the way you, you, your ethos believes. Uh, HTO, unique compartment, whatever, realignment options we call it. Uh, most F1, posteromedial soft tissue release, unconstrained. F2, F3s, 
Uh, oftentimes, you'll need a posterolateral release, minimal tubal resection. Again, I cannot overemphasize this, five to six millimeters. And almost always a primary implant, five, seven percent, you might need a constraint. But for F4 varieties, F4 various deformities in our classification, always you will need a constraint option. Using this algorithm, uh, certainly we have never done a pie crusting or a media epicondylar osteotomy. And we've been able to achieve uh, over a long period of time a, a balanced uh, knee. So in conclusion, we, we believe like the valgus knee, this is a complex multiplanar deformity and you need to understand the pathology of the structures. Uh, our firm belief that most various deformities can be treated by offering that do not need compromising the integrity of the crucial MCL. And by doing this, you can still achieve very predictable long-term solutions. And certainly in our experience, we reported this also in the, in the Indian journal. Um, we have a 15-year survivorship of the senior virus cohort of uh, 92%. Uh, Leo, I have a video. Is it all right? Would you like me to? It's just a yes, short sir. seven Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's all yours. The time is all yours, sir. As long as you wish to take, sir. No worries, no. So this is a, a persona CR. Uh, this is treated uh, uh, surgery. We, we we use a vertical midline incision, as I'm sure most of you do. Medial parapetular uh, skin incision. We uh, this is what I was saying. We do our releases as part of the. Uh, Exposure. Uh, we take down the intercondylar ostrophytes because that decompresses your uh, PCL. So we spend a little bit of time trying to uh, open up that intercondylar space, much like the arthroscopy surgeons do a notch plasty. This is a osteotomy plasty, if you like. Um, we mark out the white side line and uh, the trans epicondylar axis. Uh, we always do multiple uh, checks on this intermediary guide. We yeah. get our suction. This is the persona knee system. Um, I'm not sure if you're, you're familiar with it, but this is the, the, the same sort of system that I think that Tune has, um, where you have one millimeter incremental uh, uh, sizes. So we start with the distal uh, resection. And the distal femoral resection. Uh, you take down about nine millimeters from the, the distal femur. So this uh, uh, system takes out equal amounts of bone from the distal and posterior femurs, nine millimeters both sides. This is your sizing guide. Uh, again, this is a um, fundamentally an anterior instrumentation system. This is your femoral finishing guide. So it's a pretty robust uh, cutting jig. You can see through the bones so and makes it a little uh, less uh, challenging. We don't really have a particular methodology of what cuts we do first or second. We just do them differently, I guess, each day. But at the end of it, that completes your femur. And once you've done that, we take down again the balance of the, uh, you can see over here that there is this posterior uh, intercondylar rostified. Uh, this is a cruciate retaining design. So, you know, we are very, very methodical about taking that part out. And this is a posterior contour rostified. Uh, so, we basically decompress the, uh, the intercondylar notch. So, you free up the, uh, the PCF. Um, this will allow you to sort of access the, the back of the, of the tibia, any loose bodies, and usually they lurk behind the PCL. It allows you to just pull it out and remove it. Um, we did this slightly back to front, uh, the medial meniscectomy and the posterior medial um, uh, corner release. Uh, so this is the medial meniscus. Um, so typically we would do this and then do the resection of the tibia that you would see that you saw earlier. So we go a long way back and at this point of time we would also ha have done the lateral meniscectomy. 
it's interesting that the minute you take down the lateral meniscus, the, the, the tibia just sort of floats free and comes out. You may have noticed that we do not use home and retractors. And uh, so again, this is, uh, we are marking out the agaki line. Uh, we take the tibial resection in terms of uh, an extramedullary system uh, that we use. Uh, again, uh, five, six millimeters, seven at the most. Uh, in fact, we use a slightly bigger tibial wafer if this is less deformity, if it's like five or 10 degrees, we typically take about eight or nine millimeters of the tibia. If it is very severe deformity, we'll cut down on our tibia uh, and we'll go down to about five, six, almost always under seven millimeters. Uh, so once you've done that, you take down the uh, uh, the tibial wafer. You try and preserve the uh, the piece here by cutting around the the posterior notch of the resected tibial segment. Um, so that pretty much is your resections all done. A lot of people ask me. Do you not balance your knee? Do you not check for the balance on flexion and extension? I think that's a great point. Um, so this is the way we size our tibia. Rather than putting it on the, on the cut surface, we put it on the resected surface. It gives us a very good index. And this is how we balance our knee. We put in our trials. And rather than putting blocks and laminar spreaders, because you already have a released situation, you can pretty much jack it up and crank it up a long way. So we use uh, we use our trials. We start with a, this comes to the base size is ten millimeters, and uh, we we use this as trials. So we check our ranges through 30, 60, 90, 120. Check our pedal tracking. Uh, one of the systems uh, that you have with uh, this, I'm sure you have this with the other systems as well is the fact that you can put these incremental devices, we call these the SHIM, S-H-I-M. So without taking anything, you can go from 10 to 11. So they have little markers which tell you it's a one millimeter increment. And you just sort of float it in till such time as you think it is uh, completely stable to your level of stability. Like we say, like I mentioned, two mil one to two millimeters of medial, three to four, two to three on, or four on the lateral side. So that's pretty much the way we do our we do our uh, um, total knee replacements for the various knee. That is our uh, in this case, obviously she was stable. We were able to achieve correction, so we have not actually demonstrated the patient. So with that, I, I think we, we I come to the end of this uh, presentation. I am happy to take any questions or any comments. And then we can, uh, we can go on to the next slide. So uh, if I can just uh, bring it, but, uh, just emphasize something that is uh, uh, very important that Sir mentioned, and maybe he can elaborate a little bit more on that because I myself had a tough time with one patient and I have, a, had, a, I have had an extensive discussion with him on that. So it basically it goes against the logical thinking that you would have to release the lateral side to get an, uh, uh, in a varus knee because in a varus knee you expect all the tightness to be on the medial side. But what Sir just mentioned is that you release the postural lateral corner because he says that is where the tether is which contributes to uh, 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 con contraction contributing to instability if you're retaining it a PCL. So could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. So um, so if you look at the, the, the knee, I don't know if you can see my fist, but if you look at the various knee, the typical various knee does that. That is the angulation. And those will correct themselves just with the release. Then you have the knees that are subluxated, which means that there's a torsional element. And the minute it goes into that torsional component, the postural lateral tether, we did some cadaveric studies. In fact, we went uh, crazily enough looking for a lot of cadavers that had osteoarthritic knees, and we actually found a couple of them on unclaimed bodies at the uh, medical institute, and they were kind enough to sort of let us dissect them. And we actually did a, 
cadaveric demonstration of, and this tissue is actually the postural lateral corner just behind the popliteus tendon. And the minute you actually take a number of 11 or 15 blade, which is five crusted in the postural lateral capsule, just at the level of the resected tibia, that alone does not uh, uh, release the, the tether. You need to tether, you need to release the pie crusted, or you need to pie crust the popliteus tendon along its substance. And it actually, you can actually feel a little pop and then it suddenly springs back into, into. And I was actually very, very convinced. I mean, I was also for many, many years, my, my boys used to ask me, said, are you sure you're doing something that because nobody's ever described this. And then we went back and reviewed in literature. There are only four articles on this and we elaborated on this. But I got convinced when I had this, uh, one of my associates operating, this lady was, happened to be his aunt. And he said, you know, do you mind if I do it? And I said, absolutely. And he called me back and he said, something's not right. And he had closed the wound. And then we took an exchange. That's the one I showed. And then we opened this up we actually took out the polyethylene and all we did was pie crusted this, it just popped back into place. So that was really sort of my, uh, sort of the, the final sort of uh, block that I had in my mind, are we looking at something which is not physiological? And that convinced me that in this cohort, and then we started looking at these more and more and these really severe torsion subluxated deformities. You just pipe cross that and it's a piece of cake. And the way it just falls into place, uh, and because you've resected only about five or six millimeters, you can get away with a 10 or 11, 12 millimeter insert. You can use your PS or CRs or whatever. So we, we rarely, if ever, even in these really severe deformities, we almost never need to go into these horrific uh, sort of constrained options like the TC3 or the LCCK or the RHK. And, uh, and so uh, going from what you just explained, it wouldn't really apply only to a CRD, it would apply to a PS knee as well, if you're doing a PS as well. So if you're sacrificing yeah. your cruciate, you're better off releasing that bit as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so regardless of what your, your bias towards the cruciate is, this will just help you to align your femur with the tibia just balances out. My, my thing with, with knees, and again, something I grew up with, with John Insel used to sort of, he used to, he used to worship the medial collateral. And he always, always mentioned this, uh, that the medial complex is the critical complex. He used to call it the crucial critical complex. And he said, whatever you do, do not touch the MCM. I think it's, it's very, very true. It's even truer when we do revision surgery because a lot of times you have instability, you don't have ligaments. So the, for us, when we do a, a revision, we do, we do a ton load of revision, the only deciding fact, if your MCL is right, you'll get away with, uh, with a PS, but your MCL is gone, even as CCK doesn't work, then you go to a, you shift over to a con really constrained type of an option. So, um, the medial complex and the superficial collateral ligament, which sort of, uh, I, I cringe at the thought of somebody pie crusting because it, it is only about 10 or 11 millimeters across and a, a Bart Parker knife 15, 11 is actually going to transect it. And we've actually seen quite a few of these patients who come to us with the instability at three months, four months, and, um, you know, fortunately, a couple of them, uh, I happened to know the surgeons that worked with me in the past. So I, I called them up and I said, you know, can you just describe to me what you did? He said, sir, we were struggling with getting the balance and we pie crusted the medial collateral. So, and when we went in, the, the MCL was actually gone. So the post medial complex is intact, but the MCL per se was gone. And so these patients had a very stable in full extension the minute they went into 30, 45 degrees of flexion, they were actually subluxating and externally rotating. So uh, the one last question on this again, sir, how deep do you go with your 11 blade knife in the post lateral corner? Because there are certain things behind which we really wouldn't uh, want to damage, especially yeah. the common so, coronal nerve. And the other thing is how wide an area do you release? 
So just just about a centimeter, and you go about three to four millimeters. You take a Bart Parker knife, you take a fifteen, just and you keep keep your finger right on top of it of the tether. And as you puncture one, it, you can feel it slacken. So you just go and it's basically just four max five millimeters. And uh, once you've done that, you can actually move it. Take a one of your pickup. Uh, forceps or not your forceps, just run it across so any little fibers go away. And then we take the, uh, the, the 18 gauge needle and the central part of the popliteus tendon immediately above our, uh, our release level, about six or eight multiple punches on the popliteus. And that's actually an audible pop. And you can see the things sort of suddenly spring back at back. Yes, sir. So uh, maybe we can go on to the next talk as well, sir. One last question. Yes, sir. Jagger, sir, yes. please go in. Yeah. Good evening, Ashok Raja sir. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was there with you in 2003 in Sitaram Bharti. I Astros. remember that, Jagesh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was a very nice and excellent talk, sir. Uh, we all know that uh, preserving crucial uh, crucial ligament in osteoarthritic knee it is uh, easier. But in case of severely deformed rheumatoid knee, still you preserve crucial ligament and uh, do the replacement or any of the options you have. Uh, you have. Uh, so great, great question. Um, again, with uh, with cruciates, cruciate if nothing else is is a stabilizer. It gives you a posterior support. And our belief is just as you balance your medial and lateral ligaments, your medial, medial complex and the lateral complex, you balance your posterior complex with the petal tendon. So it's basically a four quadrant. Your back is PCL, front is your petal ligament, MCL, LCL on the two sides. So to answer your question, yes, we, we retain the cruciates in rheumatoids as well. Um, Again, we have published this fairly extensively. We've done histomorphological uh, studies of the PCL. Uh, we have uh, published in the JOA on the fate of the PCL in uh, CR knees. Um, so about 75-80% the PCL is, is viable. In the others, it is a possibly non-viable, but it is a collagen strut. So if nothing else, it gives you the stability. Uh, possibly that doesn't make a great scientific explanation, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And even at about 10, 12, 15 years, if you try and push it back to a posterior uh, drawer sign, a lot of them will be very stable. I, I must make a, a disclaimer here. Like with everyone else, we've had our share of late PCL ruptures also. So it's not to say that every PCL retaining knee will go on for 20 years. Sometimes they will fail, they will fall back, injuries or jerks or something. And if that happens, you have the choice of going over to yes or to more. Yeah. So, uh, do, uh, so uh, just taking forward your last point there, if you have a late rupture of a PCL of a well-functioning knee, do we always need to rush into surgery? Because... We do know PCLs can heal a bit. So, is there a is there a is there a role for conservative management? If it's a high demand patient, uh, Leo, I think you should. If it's a very elderly patient, 75, 80, whose expectations out of that knee are very modest, they you know basically want to do stuff around the house. Um, you can definitely get away with it. The only challenge they face really is coming downstairs. And that is the time when they say, you know, my knee buckles on me. So you sit down and discuss with them. But more often than not, I, my, my tendency is to offer them this. Uh, and ever since we've been <clears throat> doing the persona, we are extremely happy to offer this to them because you take out the CR insert and put in a medial or an ultra congruent insert. It takes literally about 10 minutes for the surgery to be done and, you know, you're stable again. So, we, we have that comfort level with us at the moment. Right. So, uh, could you go ahead? Uh, maybe we can start the next talk as well. So. Yeah. Right. So... <clears throat> 
uh, this is the second talk. In fact, this is the second time today that I'm uh, I was moderating a me meeting at the uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences on robotic uh, intervention. Um, so I'm going to run through this very very quickly. Uh, and again, please feel free. So when we look at uh, th these are very old figures, 2003, and they that point in time. Uh, almost 400,000 primaries and 32,000 revisions. If you look at the 2018 data, this is now almost a million plus, means 1 million and 300,000. So everything has gone up exponentially. And uh, typically, a lot of these, in terms of revisions, the, the demographics, the costs and uh, all the penalties the patients and surgeons are having to pay. These are our own collection of uh, revisions. We, on an average, we do about 15 revisions every month. And this is some of our um, collection that we, we have uh, done over the, over the years. Uh, they're actually great fun. But let's look at the, the, the real issue. Tom Ferring, again, a very old, Reviewed 440 revisions, early failures within five years, and the commonest cause were what you see here, infection, instability, and those times, cementless fixation was quite popular, and they were the uh, reason why this happened. You go back a little, uh, 2002, uh, Sharkey's paper, I mean, he's revised this in 2014. And at that point, again, early and late common re reasons were instability, poly failure, uh, infection, and instability. Fortunately, today, poly is not failing because we are much better poly. But sadly, both instabilities and infections continue to be dominant. Uh, so when you look at 55% of the early group uh, reasons for revision, you see infection and aseptic loosening. In the late group, again, <clears throat> you see uh, malrotation, polyethylene wear in the late revisions. This is the registry again, 2011, if you look at the 2020 um, Australian, um, 2019 Australian registry data, it's pretty similar. So really what has, the only thing that has changed is that we don't see com uh, commonly Polyethylene failures, we don't see metal breakages, but instability, petalar issues, infection continue to dominate uh, this, this whole thing. And then Phil Noble and the very dear friend came out in 2005 and said, uh, patients with knee replacements don't do as well as those with hip replacement. And that really put the cat among the pigeons. Everybody started to to talk about it and uh, people realized and today it's a, it's a dogma that knee patients are less satisfied than hip patients. So when we look at the uh, aseptic loosening, we're not going to go into various diagnostic modalities except to say that there are radiolucencies, any infection, any failed knees always look for signs of overt or covert infection. This is some typical radiographs. Even in something as obvious as this, you want to uh, exclude infection. Then we look at the instability. And again, the one thing that I want to highlight is collateral ligament incompetence, whether it's because uh, you've done releases which are aggressive or you bypassed the collaterals or because of valgus knee, uh, your MCL is, is gone on. So, and this will cause instability. And if, the important thing is even in uh, with constraint like TC3 or LCCK, these knees will fail. So malalignment. So we are all we are looking at things that the surgeon could have done better, but did not for whatever reason. And these will all cause aseptic loosening, poly wear, maltracking, and so on. Again, we talk about papillary instability. Again, we talk about malrotation, polyethylene wear, and various ways to diagnose this. So we come to the topic that we have. So when we look at all of these. Um, failure mechanisms. And we went through various iterations of technology. We went through PSI, we went through uh, navigation. None of them really stood the test of time until about seven, eight years ago when robotics made its uh, 
entry into the into the uh, orthopedic armamentarium. Interestingly enough, the one that started off with, and even today, which has really taken off, is the Unicom apartment. And it's predicted to grow 35% in the last four or five years that I've been associated with robotics has gone up exponentially. And what they've done, been able to demonstrate is that the confident alignment is better with the robotic group. Outliers are few. But the real question is, does this justify robotic assistance in all cases? So in the uni space, uh, alignment is absolutely critical. Aseptic failure is multifactorial and most common cause is malalignment. And in most revisions, you'll find that the components, the femur or tibia or both, have been malpositioned. And it was with this in mind that robotics came, and ever since robotics came, they have been reporting some excellent short-term results. So the mean square root in the robotic group in terms of uh, positioning was, was better. Uh, Arlen Hansen from Mayo, a femoral component is better, but he said not, no great changes in the tibial component. And it also gives you a more conservative tibial cut. So instead of using 10, 11, 12, which you, you sometimes tend to do with manual, uh, eight and nine millimeters is the base level of inserts is more common. Um, pain was less. Uh, the forgotten joint score was much better in the robotic group. But obviously, they are not equipped to be talking about long-term survivorship. Uh, I can sort of, for a, for a fact, verify the fact that the pain in the robotic cohort is significantly less than in the manual um, variety, and they recover a lot quicker. Having said this, let's, let's give the, the, the flip side. And this is our own experience. We've done about 1,100 uh, unis to date. Our 15-year survivorship is about 90%. And we had an unacceptable alignment in 4% of our cases. A lot of these were in our initial cases where we were still learning what the right way of doing it. Uh, all of these were fixed bearing cemented unis, uh, some with fairly primitive technology, technology and all of these were, were implanted manually. So we had no use of technology over here. When it comes to total knees, again, we talk about malalignment going on to failures. Again, interestingly enough, um, Seth Parrott with, our, with uh, uh, Jean-Noël Argensen from Marseille in France uh, actually mentioned that patients with neutral alignment, what we all talk about, plus minus uh, three degrees, had a much higher uh, revision rate as compared to the outliers. And particularly, valgus outliers actually did the best. So really an interesting article, interesting paper. In fact, um, Seb Parrott is a very dear friend. He was on the panel this afternoon, and we were discussing this very same thing. So uh, I think we are now getting to a stage where we know what we want to achieve and we're able to achieve it. So uh, again, when you look at Johan Bellemans, for those of you who are into the alignment uh, bandwagon, he described the constitutional alignment and uh, he said anything within one to two degrees is, is, is all right. Um, in 2011, Song, he's a very prolific uh, surgeon from Korea. No difference in coronal alignment in terms of function and survivorship. We look at 2017, um, slightly better SF36 in the robotic cohort. Um, Again, from 17, no evidence. Uh, to indicate a worse outcome. So survivorship at five and 10 years were comparable. Which brings us down to the real sort of nitty gritties of uh, robotics. The typical uh, robot costs anywhere from one to $1.5 million. Um, institutions can afford it. Individuals in India, of course, some, of pe some people have invested in them. Some have invested in more than one robots. Um, but if you have the money, it's, it's, it's a useful uh, toy to have and play with. Uh, it has a learning curve. It's getting shorter with the advent and development of uh, the newer systems. Um, earlier systems used to use preoperative CT, which uh, had radiation issues. And the other downside is contract infections, injuries to the MCL, patellar tendon, and neurovascular injury. So this is typically the... Uh, Time neutral, it takes about 
15 to 18 to 20 cases to get time neutral. Um, and when you look at literature review, it's very hard to say that this is a, definitely a better option compared to the uh, uh, compared to the other uh, system. Uh, though some people have this, something called the MASTI index, macroscopic soft tissue injury score, is less in the robotic cohort than in the manual cohort, I guess, with all the retractors and the human levers. But when you look at outcomes in implant survivorship, at least to the time that they have been able to evaluate these at five to seven, eight years, there seems to be no real difference. <clears throat> so this was uh, an article that was... Uh, uh, written out in August 18, there was a symposium in robotics and orthopedics. Um, it was initially introduced in 1980. Robodoc was the first system, 92. Uh, they talked about better alignment, sizing, and placement. And uh, Brian Parsley in his editorial wrote, possibly the indications are that most often, most likely, it will stand the test of time. So the initial results were exciting, but the roadmap is is particularly sort of a little confused at the moment. And a lot of the guys who are involved with this believe that it's going to come out in its new avatar with artificial intelligence and augmented reality. Let's look at this very interesting x-ray. This is a patient. This is one of my, actually, this was the third knee that I did when I came back from England. This was done in 1989. So this is actually 32 years. This is a severe deformity, a various deformity. This is a Freeman Samuelson uncemented knee. She has an uncemented all poly tibia, has lasted 32 years, has 150 degrees of flexion. This lady is a is an industrialist matriarch. She sits on the floor, eats on the floor, continues to use Indian style toilets. So 32 years without any technology. So we really did sound principles, balanced it, and we got a secure fixation. So can we say that robotics has a role in a busy clinical practice? The jury is out on that. So very quickly about uh, robot, robot uh, actually came from robota, which meant forced labor. It's a Polish word. There are two types, the haptic and the autonomous. The robodoc was the autonomous, went out of failure. And current systems, uh, virtually every company has uh, uh, the DPU uh, has the Wellis. Then uh, you have the Rosa, you have the Mako, uh, you have the Navio, and there are several others. So there are a whole bunch of these systems. But this is really a snapshot of all the technologies that that I have actually been through since I started. And believe it or not, um, I don't know if robotics. I think it will stand the test of time, and newer materials will better instrumentation for sure. Uh, newer implants, all the companies have come out with, uh, with uh, newer implants, but if you look at uh, recent li uh, articles on them, the outcomes, including the uh, forgotten joint score, are very comparable to their predecessors. So these are the common ones in the market. This is something that we have uh, played with, Smith and Nephew and Mako. Again, when you look at meta-analysis, very comparable 2018, fairly recent article. Uh, this was a very telling comment. I mean, I, I'm a great uh, admirer of Bob Booth, very dear friend. Current survivorship in 98%, 95%. Uh, but the real issue is not so much survivorship. We know knees will survive for 25, 30 years done well. The real question is, are they going to be more satisfied because your placement, your sizing, your balancing soft tissue? So that's really the critical ingredient. And some of us would like to believe that using a robot will probably give you that slight of half degree, one degree of better alignment and allow you to balance the soft tissues through its entire arc of movements. So this is really just Loner's uh, comment in the same uh, article on robotics. Uh, so we are able to achieve that target, the bullseye in both units. And I must add that as far as robotics is concerned and unique compartment, there is no argument. It has a clear head start and the outcomes of uh, the uni with the robot are definitely better. We've been doing this now for, for some time and it's definitely a better. And its impact on TK is more, the jury's not quite out on that. 
and as I've written here, impact on the UK is getting. So th this is a this is the final slide. The promise of a robotically executed TKR is seductive. Currently, there's no evidence that out uh, that uh, robotics will outperform a well done TKR by a well trained surgeon. I'd like to thank you for your attention and be very happy to uh, take any questions or any comments. So thank you so uh, thank you so much, sir. That was a that was a wonderful lecture, sir. Uh, so, would it be uh, an overstatement if I were to say right now that at this point in time, robotics is still more of an advertisement gimmick rather than actual evidence-based medicine? Or would it be fair to say that there is enough uh, uh, evidence to suggest that the use of robotics, at least in certain particular cases, is likely to improve results? I think a second yeah, I think your second statement, uh, Leo, is probably the writer statement. Uh, as far as TKRs is concerned, I think the jury is still out. I don't know that we have definite quantified uh, paradigms that have measured and actually come to a conclusion that robotically done knees patients are infinitely better. In fact, we, we, we had a couple of uh, cases where we did a robotic on one side, we did a conventional on the other side. And everybody, including the physios and the patient was blinded to that fact. They, they thought they had the same surgery on both sides. And we reviewed them at about six months and they couldn't tell the difference. They, 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 the x-rays looked all right, ranges of movement. The only defining difference, if you will, is the fact that the robotically done side recovers faster and has less pain. So getting to 90 degrees is quicker and easier. And they seem to indicate that the first six weeks was nicer on this side than it is on the other. But in terms of um, outcomes, radiographs, ranges of movement, exactly the same. And uh, in the, uh, I, we had a lot of discussion. At, I think it was in the year 2000, the last Arcus meeting I attended was in 2019 before the COVID. And uh, uh, 2019 was almost entirely robotics, with so a huge robotic uh, component in the Arcus meeting in Dallas. Sir. Yeah. And uh, I was attending each of their, the Navio, the Maker, the Rosa, they were all having their live demos going. And interest, interestingly, you know, there are issues with the Navio because it is a burr-based kind of a design. But if you look at the Mako, it is a blade-based design. But even the Mako surgeon was saying there is a deflection which happens, which can make the cut uh, uh, erroneous and things like yeah. that. So for all the money that you spend, it is still not technology which is which is mature. It is still an evolving technology. It's in its infancy. I mean, in fact, one of the things we, we had two engineers, industry folks who were presenting, uh, one from the debut side, an Australian lady and uh, an American guy who's uh, presenting on the Navio. And, um, you know, more in jest than anything else, I said, given the fact that you guys are driving your research based on our outcomes, you should be actually subsidizing 90% of the cost and giving it to us at about a hundred thousand dollars and I think that's a fair statement because uh, clearly we have evolved in terms if you look at the new designs I don't think there's a lot more that's going to change in the next few years but I think where we are going to change is in terms of being able to understand the kinematics and being able to logically insert those implants with the right amount of tension and I think to getting your rotation and balance right uh, again, I was reading, I think it is the um, November edition of the JOA, which I think makes a very interesting, there's a very interesting article, which says that patient dissatisfaction rates are higher in those patients who do not have a balanced range of friction from 0 to 120. So what, that, that's really what we, we're talking about. You need to have that balance all the way from zero to 120, and it has to be consistent. I guess when you're doing it manually, it's good from zero to 45, maybe 45 to 60 is a little off, and 60 to 90 it gets better, and then 20, 90 to 120 is kind of all over the place. Whereas with, with this robotics, hopefully what we're trying to do is to that curve becomes a lot smoother, 
And to that extent, one of the things that I, I certainly uh, foresee is AI and augmented reality and, and stuff coming in and hopefully you know, enhancing the capabilities of the robot. But I couldn't agree more with you, Leo. I think the robots that we're seeing today are going to be a joke in the next five years because these are, these are cumbersome. They are all over the place. You, you need trackers, you need pins. Uh, so it, it is a bit of a messy thing at the moment, but I, I think we've begun in the right direction. And I have no doubt in about five years, a lot of us will be talking about robotics as the go-to method. Thank you so much, sir. So, uh, if there are any more questions from the, uh, from the uh, delegates, uh, uh, please feel free to ask, sir. And, uh, and uh, sir, uh, we have a couple of case presentations, uh, one from a fellow uh, with the Dr. Jaykish and sure. one from a postgraduate student in from Punjab Medical College. So uh, 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 if we can start with the presentations, uh, uh, Sakiril, uh, Dr. Kumarwil, uh, uh, sir, could you tell me, uh, just uh, remind me, Dr. Shiva Bharati, right, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Shiva Bharati. Mm. Is, is, is he ready, sir? Is he ready with our presentation, sir? Yes, sir, he's ready. And uh, Dr. Navin from uh, Dr. Jaykish <laughs> Hospital, uh, his hospital would also be having a case for presentation. So, uh, uh, Shakti, can we bring one of them on if whoever is ready? Uh, Dr. Navin, are you ready? Is he there? Yes, sir. He is there. Uh, Dr. Navin is there and uh, Dr. Bar. Uh, one more. Shiva Bharati. Shiva Bharati. Shiva Bharati. I made him into a pan the panel. Yeah, yeah, if any of them is ready, can, can they start the presentation? I think. I think Dr. Navin need to share the presentation, sir. Uh, he is in a panel only. Dr. Navin, are you there? Hello, sir, can you get Naveen? Him? Yeah, yeah. Navin, are you there? Yes, sir. Share your presentation. Yes, Dr. Navin, please go ahead. Yes, Dr. Navin. Share your PPT. Thank you, Dr. Hugh Mare. Thank you. you. Yes. yes. Yes, sir. I just made him into that presentation mode. Yes. He has to speak. Yeah, Dr. Navin, please go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Navin, we don't hear you. Uh, Dr. Navin? Sir, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah sir, you are pain. audible, but it is so low. Uh, can you increase your volume or either can you a little bit louder, sir? Hello? Hello? Yes, yeah, sir, you are audible, sir. You are audible, sir. Today I am here to discuss uh, small case discussion. A 36 year old male had sustained road traffic accident presented to our hospital with growing pain. This was the initial presentation of our patient where he had a left groin pain. And the left side shows the disruption of the ideal line as well as the posterior wall. So from X-rays, we got the idea there is an involvement of the exterior wall and posterior columns. With this idea, we, we actually tried to get operator of this and the idea of the view. But due to similar pain, we didn't get the view. So we proceeded to CT scan. This is the CT scan of the patient where it shows a portal actual 3D reconstruction view. We can able to see clearly that the disruption of the posterior wall and posterior column as well as it is involved in the supraacetabular region. So now we have to make a decision that is to manage conservative on the surface. So 
It is an unstable pattern which appears in shapes and for the procedure to progress rather than back approach to the trochanter cost total extension. Basically, trochanter cost total extension is considered to access the supra and stabular areas. The complication of the procedure is the university of the qualification and the previous students will be able to follow the procedure. Is stated in your third day in class if we can access the trochanter cost total. And a lot of literature also support that trochanter cost total is effective for such a supra acetabular area involvement. And complications of heterotrophic constipation and trochanter cost total. This is another study from our teams. Uh, it also supported that cost total will give for mid term results. And uh, the complications quoted in the literature were osseal necrosis, abductor weakness, heterotrophic constipation. And secondary arthritis. This is the two month follow up of our patients where we can see the good consolidation of the posterior column and patient was given walking with support. This is the fourth month follow up. The patient presented to us with pain, inability to walk. Can anyone from the panel please come and how to proceed after this? Sir, uh, Joseph, sir, uh, you have to unmute. Uh, Navin, your voice is almost inaudible. Uh, so you, so you just you're, you're asking for comments regarding what would be the option of treatment, right? Hello, do you hear us, Navin? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, would uh, any of the, uh, I think we are running short of time. So can you just go ahead and do the presentation because uh, we are really running short of time. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. To be proceeded to CT scan, we are considered a mechanism of neck and brain resorption, whereas almost complete resorption is intended to be taken. That's what I'm going to do. This is the coronal brain where you can Voice is not clear. Navin, you are almost inaudible. Matha, I think Matha, others should uh, mute their uh, mics. Jaykish, sir. I think Jaykish. Jay Navin, talk louder. No, no, Jaykish, you, you should mute your mic, pa. Yeah, yeah, I already muted my mic. Yeah, but other than sound on the truth. Navin, can you go ahead? Sir, am I audible now? Yeah, it's better now. Yeah, it's better now. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, we proceeded with CT scan, which is shows there is a complete resorption of head and neck of the proximal femur. Naveen, sir, I hope you have joined in two devices. That's what it is getting echo. Can you disconnect one device and then okay, join okay. it? Okay, okay. So, now am I audible? Yeah, you're better. You're better. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. So there is a literature also supporting uh, within four months. What is the reason for this uh, this much head and neck resorption? Either it could be due to muscular trauma during the surgical procedure. There may be damage to the vasculature by handling the short external rotators. So that is also the reason. For it. The vanishing bone disease. This is a rare, uh, rare entity. Antimonas Goran Stout syndrome. The patient is very present to this uh, pain as well as swelling and functional impairment. The diagnosis is always confirmed by histopathology. Angiometers, uh, the criteria to be looked at angiometers tissue presence, absence of cellular atypia, animal or no osteoplastic resorption. Evidence of local bone progressive resorption, non expense, non ulcerative lesion, absence of visceral involvement, osteolytic radiographic patent, and negative hereditary metabolic or neoplastic process. So, can anyone? So, this also should be considered as a differential diagnosis. Sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are better now. Please go ahead. Right. You are audible. Decision making. So currently, we have only two options: either we need to fuse the joint, or we need to scope or do plastic. So coming to patient demand, patient is actually a shop owner. It is he will do only he will work. So if you want to fuse the surgery to proceed, it will give the pain really as well as mobile joint. So we proceed with arthroplasty, which is an unsuitable arthroplasty procedure. 
intraoperative was unusual where the, the, the sorry the fracture was completely consolidated except we found that there was a small difference in the superior dome which was reconstructed with highly aggressive photography using multiple jobs as well as hydroxyapatite coated stem as well as Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Naveen. Thank you so much. I think it was a tough case. Uh, uh, did you have uh, your cage or cage options prepared and kept ready just in case? Yes, sir. Actually, we thought it was a completely good consolidation to form in CD. Okay. We didn't keep a cage as an option, but unfortunately, once we started dreaming, we found there is a small difference, almost around 3 mm or 4 mm difference. So we just harvested the earlier crust back and we kept it. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we will go on to the next case as well. Uh, 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 thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, sir. You, thank you so much. Sir. Thank, thank you so much. You. Sir, uh, uh, Shakti, can we bring on Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Shiva Bharati? Bharati? I already is a panelist only, sir. Uh, I request him. Bharati, to... are, you, are you prepared? Are you ready? Dr. Bharati, are you ready? Kumaravel, sir, is he there? Uh, can you just look, put, up, put, up, put in the words of him? He's there, he's there. Yeah. I see, I see Subramanya Bharati's uh, photograph on the... Yeah, uh, yeah, sir. He's yeah. the one who was sharing the presentation, okay. sir, I think so. Uh, sir, is it audible? Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead, doctor. Okay, sir. Are my slides are visible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone, sir. I am Dr. Shiva Bharati. The final year postgraduate from Tanjavur Medical College. Today, I am going to present a prospective study on clinical results in total hip arthroplasty done in our Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology. Uh, small introduction. Uh, total hip uh, replacement refers to replacement of a diseased hip joint with the artificial head and a... That is audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. You're audible. Uh, keep talking. You're loud and clear. Please go ahead. Uh, no, you're not audible now. Are you speaking? Sir, it's audible. Yeah, you are audible. Now. Yes, sir. Talk, talk. An introduction. Totally replacement refers to a replacement of a diseased hip joint with an artificial femoral head. Uh, head and the astablum. And the goals of total hip re replacement are to provide a mobility to relieve the pain and correct the deformity while maintaining the stability of the joint. The functional outcome of 
total hip replacement depends uh, depends on the various factors patients profile surgical methods and the implants used uh, all of which have roles to play ultimate quality of life patients get achieved the aim of the study was the early changes in physical activity and functional after total hip arthroplasty using both subjective and objective methods and to identify the predictors of outcome of total hip replacement the methodology includes uh, prospect the study was done in our uh, orthopedic department from january 2019 to may 2021 30 patients were included in this study three patients had insufficient follow up ev- evaluation were excluded from the study after initial assessment You're, you're, you're not heard again, Dr. Bharati. My inclusion criteria, yeah. am I audible, yeah. sir? Yes, 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 please go ahead. Okay. My inclusion criteria, age is more than 18 years, so unstable gift. Uh, <laughs> my diagnosis includes chronic arthritis. Uh, <laughs> sir? Please go ahead, please keep, keep going, keep going. Uh, include uh, avascular necrosis. and uh, ankylosing spondylitis rheumatoid arthritis and uh, non union neck of femur my exclusion criteria includes age less than 18 years evidence of any infection neurological disease or history of sciatica with neurological signs and uh, revision to total hip arthroplasty and any psychiatric illness pre operatively all patients are uh, assessed for anesthesia fitness i got uh, informed and written consent for my study Uh, and the clinical evaluation of uh, preoperative Harrison hip score and the limb length and uh, uh, objective uh, six minute uh, six minutes walking distance and uh, preoperative templating was done to determine the acetabular cup size and the femoral stem size and uh, all patients are started with uh, preop antibiotics. Uh, we used a post uh, commonly uh, posterior mo- mo- morris approach in all patients post operative antibiotics dvt prophylaxis and uh, early ablation uh, was advised on the next uh, first post operative period uh, all patients were uh, published with uh, crouches uh, radiological assessment uh, was done with uh, x ray and ct radiographs for uh, measure- measuring the as- Astabular inclination and uh, astabular version and femoral offset. Clinical assessment include post-op Harrison hip score, river med visual gait analysis and uh, pain score and a trundle and birth test. Follow up uh, one month after surgery, then every three months until one year. Patient assessment, uh, limb, as I already told, limb length discrepancy, Harris hip score, river med visual gait analysis, trundle and birth test. a stabler version and inclination and femoral offset ஜூனியர் <laughs> sex mostly males as a incident of neck of femur fracture more common in males that's why we got uh, more male distribution in our study indications surgical indications uh, six patients uh, diagnosed with uh, avascular necrosis um, and 17 were uh, non union neck of femur and uh, four patients were uh, chronic arthritis uh, mostly uh, 62% of patients had non union neck of femur 
we had a complication of on case uh, posterior hip dislocation that around uh, 3% of uh, total case load and uh, two cases were trendelenburg positive out of 27 cases we did uh, nine cemented hip total hip arthroplasty and 80 uncemented total hip arthroplasty because uh, most patients uh, uh, are below uh, 60 years that's why the uncemented population is more uh, our harris hip score the mean harris hip score is pre operatively 45 out of 100 post operatively 83 we got very poor result in 3% population especially that uh, post dislocation hip case we got fair results in 18% and good results in 55% and excellent results in 25% the discussion the age distribution in our study shows average age of patients was 48 years majority of the patients were between 50 to 60 years males were predominant 74% uh, among uh, 27 patients three patients were developed a limb length discrepancy in our study, 80% patients had external, external functional outcome, 5% of patients have good functional outcome, and 17% patient, of patients had fair functional outcome. Only 3 had poor outcome. Younger age, male sex, and uh, better scores on walking distance and uh, hip flexibility before surgery predicted better score on walking distance following total hip arthroplasty. With uh, our study, we had a limitation. Uh, larger sample size is needed to provide the statically, uh, statistically important outcome analysis. The average follow-up of our study is 15, 15 months. A long-term follow-up of at least 5 years is needed for more significant outcome analysis. So, example of one case, uh, 22 years old male had a hip surgery two year, uh, 6 years back following accidental fall from height. Now, uh, patient presented us with a uh, complaining of pain, limping, and restriction of hip movements. Um, the, the fellow doesn't have any previous operative records. With the X-ray, uh, we seen this. We seen this X-ray. Uh, uh, we assumed uh, he had a uh, neck of femur fracture at the age of 16 years, fixed with a neck of screw fixation, cannulated screw fixation, and uh, it's. Uh, and the uh, implant is failed and the patient fixed with the uh, uncemented total, total hip arthroplasty he had a very good uh, excellent outcome Harris hip score of 95 out of 100 uh, with a minimal limb length discrepancy 0.5 cm and, uh, and our second case so, uh, 59 years old male 2 months old uh, neck of femur fracture he went for native, native treatment. He presented uh, only after two months. And the bone quality is very porotic. Even though it's 59 years, we selected as a cemented total hip arthroplasty for him. Uh, he had a limb length discrepancy of 0.4 cm. He had a uh, Harris hip score uh, 89 out of 100. Uh, he has a good outcome. That's all, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Bharati. Uh, Ashok Rajagopal, sir, are you there, sir? Sir, are you there? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, yes. as you can see, sir, we, we, we do uh, uh, encourage the postgraduate students uh, to make presentations during such meetings because it gives them an opportunity to just get used to the yeah. habit of presenting. Right. Not just that... Uh, it also gives them the opportunity to present in front of a wider audience, which invariably in includes senior uh, colleagues and uh, former professors and teachers from whose experience they can learn from. I think he, uh, Dr. Bharati should be very lucky to have been able to make this presentation in front of uh, Dr. Bharati as well as Dr. Navin. Must have been very lucky to have had these presentations in front of some someone as eminent as you are. So, if you can, uh, for the benefit of Dr. Bharati and the rest of the postgraduates, if there are any inputs regarding the presentations that you've just witnessed, sir, would you like to say a few comments as well? Uh, Leo, first of all, a very, very commendable effort. I think you're running a very, very good ship. Um, so, kudos to you and the team. The only two suggestions to the youngsters is, uh, especially to the second doctor, 
never read every word that's on your slide you what you want to do is the the people who are watching your slides are reading it anyways so what you should do is summarize that slide in two lines or three lines so that while you are talking they are reading and it's getting absorbed in their mind when you're reading they're reading it with you and consequently you know that for somebody to keep their attention span beyond the first two or three slides becomes a little difficult um unfortunately you had some challenges with your audio so you were not very clearly audible but otherwise i think great effort great presentation and i'm sure you can all will continue to get better and better at it uh at your stage in life uh, we had no such platforms to do it so i think you are blessed to have uh, such wonderful seniors to guide you and encourage you so keep it up and never stop presenting never stop learning and uh, writing and uh, also sir uh, as i just informed you this meeting is also being covered live on orco tv so for the benefit of the wider audience and uh, as it is obvious now uh, arthroplasty is becoming a more and more common procedure all around the country would you like to say a few words about the registry sir right so yes in fact uh, i think both leo and myself uh, we we are very blessed to be a part of a wonderful organization that's called the indian hip and knee society and all of you who are listening in from whichever uh, part of the country you are in we would actually encourage you to be members of this uh, ishq and it's an online application form it's a wonderful uh, platform to be in um we are actually running a registry and uh, i am the managing trustee and uh, leo dr leo joseph is the secretary he's been doing wonderful work and both of us would actually encourage every one of you to not only join the organization but to contribute into our registry because as you probably know the 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 main strength of any arthroplasty body is the amount of work that comes out of it so with your help you know we would sort of request you even if you do five cases a month put that into the registry because every case that you do it actually adds to our database and if you look at the australian or the swedish or the norwegian registry or the british registry they are powerful because of the content and the contribution from each one of you so you know as uh, office bearers of this organization we would Uh, you know make a very sincere request to uh, you a to be members of the organization and it's an online application form which you can download and fill and send back and certainly to contribute to the registry because you know if you contribute we learn and if we learn the whole country learns and we, we're all uh, sort of going to go from strength to strength so please uh, you know take this uh, request as a personal request and do join in thank you so much sir uh, uh, we have uh, we have run through uh, we've had a wonderful meeting uh, i should uh, sincerely thank uh, dr ashok rajgopal for very kindly consenting to join a meeting of a relatively small uh, club in a vast country despite the Uh, his caliber and eminence uh, it is remarkable that he even found the time to talk to us thank you so much sir uh, kumarvel sir can i can you please come in and then give your yes, closing comments yes, as well yes. sir yes sir yes sir he was uh, uh, sir was uh, uh, very very kind enough to uh, put his concepts very clearly that is what i am uh, i am uh, i should tell because uh, we all know him as a very very uh, experienced person in the whole country and he has put his concepts so clearly to and very simply so uh, certain things which are a misconception in the uh, what we have uh, been doing and uh, uh, to avoid those uh, pitfalls he has put uh, uh, things very clearly and also a piece of advice to the uh, post graduate we uh, we ask him to uh, present uh, only around uh, the afternoon i thought uh, yes he should present because he was doing a thesis on it very good uh, piece of advice the knack of presenting is given in uh, one small uh, line you should not read the slide actually and uh, uh, that is a very important word uh, thank you sir anyway thank you so much sir you are very welcome it's been a wonderful evening yes, so thank you uh, to all of you and leo dr kumarvel yes, it's sir, been yes. a real pleasure and yes, i look forward to meeting you again in person soon
Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. And uh, for the two postgraduates who took their presentations, Dr. Navin and Dr. Bharati, please take this as a very constructive comment. You did a fantastic job. That uh, it is a it is fantastic that you came up and did a presentation on an almost national television because this will be available on all the TV whatever presentations you did. Congratulations for that. And every opportunity is an opportunity to learn from. We keep learning all the time. So and we keep learning. Uh, as long as we are alive so please don't take this in any other way this was a wonderful opportunity for you to present to someone as of, uh, of the eminence of dr ashok rajagopal thank you so much for joining in i would like to thank all the members thank you dr kumar well sir thank you so much thank you for the opportunity to present thank you thank you our case thank you aur kunj aadi the pranasti it was a very special thank you thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir. thank you so much sir. bye bye I uh, I should thank uh, the uh, John Johnson and Johnson people as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've done. I'm so sorry about this. It's been. Uh, <laughs> Not easy. Ah, uh, if Peter can say solve it, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Have a nice evening, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Recording stopped. <laughs>